Hello you crazy kids and slightly older people. Just a quick reminder that the Tykin Sons Charity Co. Charity Event is happening this Saturday. It would have been last Saturday, but I had to survive an IRL 6 day FNAF 1 power outage. Hope to see you all there. The most underrated FNAF fan game is a concept that can truly never have a definitive answer put to it. I tried doing it a couple months back with Tykin Sons Lumber Co which while it had a lot of attention early on from big creators, ended up not having as big of an impact as I thought it should have. We are now many months removed from my first Tykin Sons video, and I don't want to say I saved the game or anything, but I definitely pulled it out of the weird underrated pit it was stuck in for so long. However, if Tykin Sons is no longer the most underrated FNAF fan game, what would be the new most underrated FNAF fan game? After a bit of digging around and playing some smaller games, I eventually found it. The game we're going to talk about is Mary's Arcade by Sande. Released around a year ago, Mary's Arcade does some really refreshing and interesting things with the typical FNAF formula that are genuinely fun and challenging. Unlike most other FNAF fan games that tend to rely on fast reaction times and quick reflexes juggling a lot of things at once, Mary's Arcade takes a much slower approach to gameplay that's all about planning ahead and preparing for the threats that are making their way to your office. It's such a creative and interesting game that has sadly been largely ignored by the bigger FNAF content creator community. I kind of get it from the perspective of a YouTuber. Maybe the game just doesn't look that interesting from a surface level, but one run through the game will completely change that opinion. Honestly, if I were to get anything out of doing this video, having some other big FNAF content creators cover this game finally would be really cool. But I guess a more realistic wish here would be for you all at home to hear me out, listen to why I think this game is so underrated, and then go play it for yourself. As always, the link to the game will be in the description. Well, at this point, you're probably just dying to hear what makes this game so sick. And I'm dying to finally talk about it, after teasing it in my Fangame Direct video. Let's not waste any more time here. It's time to talk about one of the most refreshing FNAF fan games I have ever played, Mary's Arcade. Where to even begin with this? There is a lot to go over here. Even if Mary's Arcade is relatively short and simple compared to a lot of other FNAF fan games, I still somehow have a million things to talk about. I guess you could say that it's that good. <laughs> the game opens up with a screen that lets you name your character. Does this really have an impact on the game? No, but it does help you feel slightly more immersed into the world. You're not just playing as a random security guard, you're playing as you. Or anyone else you want to play as, but probably you. The game even makes fun of your name later, which only happens after you beat the fifth night. So realistically, you forgot you even entered a name at that point, and it catches you super off guard. Good stuff. One more thing before I talk about the actual game. The menus in this game are all based on the Windows XP UI, which is a really cool design choice that adds a lot of personality to the game. This old school computer aesthetic even carries over to the cameras during the night sections. Speaking of, enough stalling, it's time to get into the actual game. The office has two doors on each side, and one door in the middle. The middle door is closed and isn't important right now, but the two side doors are linked to the core of Mary's Arcade's gameplay loop. I think that the office looks pretty nice. It's probably the weakest of the areas in the location when it comes to visuals, but that's not entirely its own fault. The camera rooms have the upper hand here simply for how they were handled in this game. Unlike pretty much every other FNAF game ever with cameras, Mary's Arcade does not use the traditional TV static to make the feed and the cameras look lower quality. Instead, some really clever visuals are used that enhance the cameras in ways that many other FNAF fan games just don't. The cameras will choppily move from side to side with the occasional hiccup ruining the feed, such as parts of the feed getting glitchy or extended and warped. This game absolutely nails how an old shitty camera system would probably actually be like to use, and it does it without sacrificing any of the creepy elements. Each and every room has props in it that work well to flesh out the entire location. From this eerie jungle gym looking area, to the exit camera that you can see a little peek of the outside world from, each camera is set up in a way that makes each area both visually distinct and interesting from one another. Even the two cameras right outside the office look very different, with one being a more close-up shot and the other being a farther out shot that looks to be some kind of staff room. You can even see the arcade peeking out the door next to the fridge. These fantastic, creepy room renders mixed with the great camera effects make this location a joy to just look around. And trust me, in this game you'll be doing that a lot, so I'm glad they nailed that aspect. A couple more things to note here. Like any typical FNAF game, you can use the mouse to click on each of the different cameras. But a really great addition in this game is the ability to use the arrow keys to move around the location. 
Mary's Arcade's building is kind of set up like a circle, so you can easily move the cameras in a circle back and forth with the left and right arrow keys. On top of that, the scroll wheel on the mouse also works to go through the cameras, which is also pretty satisfying to use, but is sometimes a little too fast. So I like to stick with the arrow keys. This isn't really a feature that's like a must have for every FNAF game going forward, but it works really well in this game and is my preferred way to use the cameras. We'll get into why later, but trust me, it flows perfectly into how you play this game. However, we aren't there yet. I'm only getting started with this game's visuals. While the office and especially the camera locations look amazing, the animatronics here really steal the show in terms of impressiveness. But first, a quick side tangent. I swear, this will all make sense when we're done. Okay, let's think back to the very first FNAF game. I think it's the most fair comparison for Mary's Arcade, since both games share a lot in common. Simple location, very unsettling environments that shouldn't be that unsettling, and pretty basic animatronic designs. Here's a hot take, I'm sure you all love those. I think the FNAF 1 cast looks pretty lame. These designs really have only gotten worse over the many years since this game came out, and better versions of them were introduced in future installments. Especially the Wither designs, which I think look much better than the FNAF 1 versions. But. When I talk about the FNAF 1 cast like this, I'm strictly talking about how they look in promotional renders and stuff like that. When we move over to the actual game, it's a completely different story. The way Scott Cawthon used the camera environments and lighting to make these simple animatronic designs so creepy is probably my favorite aspect of FNAF 1. I think the show stage is a great example of this. I always felt like the animatronics looked very different here than how they normally look, and it really works to make the player feel a little uneasy. Very harsh shadows cover up a lot of the key features on the designs, and it worked so well mixed with the security camera quality and all that. Anyway, what I'm trying to get at here is that even the most basic or boring designs can be made significantly more interesting when given creepier renders from the cameras. The animatronic designs in Mary's Arcade are also pretty simple, just being some woodland animals wearing clothes. Being real, they look pretty uninteresting in renders such as this one. However, just like FNAF 1, the camera renders take this cast to a whole other level. Starting with Mary, she is pretty much never seen directly looking at the camera, and the very few times she is looking at the camera, it's usually because her head is turned all the way around, which is absolutely terrifying. Mary will often say voice lines during the nights as well, which is such a clever evolution of things like Freddy's laugh from the first game. These are animatronics after all. Realistically, they would have a couple built-in voice lines to say. Rascal is the raccoon character, and he straight up has some of my favorite renders in this entire game. He wears a brown jacket and carries around a briefcase, and just look at this render! Something about this render just looks so goddamn good. I get really heavy FNAF 1 camera vibes from it, which is probably why I love it so much. But it gets even better. This Rascal render actually has an alternative version that is just him staring directly into the camera. It's the little things like that that add a whole lot of soul to a game. Oh, I think now would be a good time to say that these characters can actually camera stack in this game, which is a really good addition that a lot of early FNAF games just don't have. Finally, we have Scarlet. Scarlet is often harder to see on the cameras compared to the other characters. This is because of her gameplay mechanic, but I do like that at least one character is more in the background. Not only does it help to not clutter the screen if a lot of animatronics are in one place, but it makes it even more unsettling to see her up close when she gets near the office or in the kitchen. Anyway, now I'm going to talk about clothes for a bit. Animatronic bands or characters wearing clothes is a pretty common thing in the real world when it comes to animatronics. Just recently I became a bit more interested in actual animatronics, and ended up falling down a rabbit hole of all these different cool characters. And yeah, most actual animatronic characters wear clothes of some kind. With that in mind, the FNAF 1 cast not wearing clothes is kind of odd? Like we're really only used to the FNAF characters not wearing clothes because it's just been a staple of the series for so long with a few exceptions. It really gives me a lot more appreciation for the FNAF Plus designs to be honest. The decision to make the cast of Mary's Arcade wear clothes was actually a really good one in my opinion, because I think it makes these characters a whole lot more creepy, compared to if they were just naked I guess. Especially Scarlet, her getup is really unsettling to me for some reason. Anyway, while these designs may be a little boring in renders outside of the game, inside of the game, they have fantastic renders that work with the lighting of the environments perfectly, that really call back to how things looked in FNAF 1. Hell, some of the best renders of these characters in the game are actually the ones of the characters peeking into the office through the doorway. The way their big ass eyes light up look amazing, and when you shine your light on them, the renders just look fantastic. I love that Mary, who pretty much never looks at the cameras, is finally looking directly at you when she reaches the door. It's just so out of place for her, and I love it. Just a few more points about the visuals, and then I'll move on to the gameplay. Like I talked about earlier, 
the camera UI is trying to look like an old computer UI, which is very fitting since the camera system here is actually on a laptop. You can see the top of the laptop while you're in the office as well, which is a very cool touch. This detail even affects the gameplay a bit since you can actually hear certain sound cues from the cameras while the laptop is down, because technically it's still right there in front of you. This encourages having the cameras down a lot, since you're not missing much in the audio department even when it's down. Why would you even want your cameras down, you ask? One of the gameplay mechanics in Mary's Arcade is that when you have the camera down, the time moves ever so slightly faster. This encourages you to try to have it down as much as possible so you can end the nights faster, which I think is a really cool risk-reward mechanic. So much important stuff happens on the cameras in this game that you really have to balance keeping an eye on them while also making the time go faster being in the office. Anyway, it's about time we go over the gameplay, I guess. I kind of got a bit of a head start there talking about the time mechanics, but trust me, this game has a ton of fresh new ideas that make it one of my favorite FNAF fan games of all time. We're really just only getting started. As established earlier, this game plays a little bit differently compared to your typical FNAF game. People often like to compare FNAF to tower defense games, which I kind of see a little bit, but this game takes that comparison to a completely different level. If you remember from the last section, I mentioned that this location is kind of set up like a circle. Each camera directly links into another one behind it and in front of it. There is a very specific reason the building is set up like this. The animatronics in Mary's Arcade move only in a circular formation around the building. Mary moves in one direction and Rascal moves in the other direction. They will never go backwards on the cameras, only forwards. This is already pretty different from most other FNAF games, which usually have the animatronics going back and forth between cameras, stalling for time and waiting. Here, you already have a 100% guarantee where each of these two animatronics will go next, which makes tracking them the camera a piece of cake. However, there's a bit of a problem for, uh, uh, yeah, here. The doorways in the office are actually more like a hallway that connect the two to each other, and that hallway is directly in the path of both Mary and Rascal. So yeah, these two uncanny-ass robots need to walk directly in front of me if they want to continue walking in a circle around the building. There's a bit of a catch, though. Mary and Rascal won't move to the next room unless they hear a noise that distracts them from the security guard. And that's where the PA system comes into play. On the camera, you're given two different tools you can use to survive the night at Mary's Arcade. The PA system is pretty self-explanatory. If you play the noise in the room directly ahead of an animatronic, they will automatically go to that room and continue their circle from there. The goal is to use this PA system when an animatronic is in the doorway at your office to make them leave you alone and allow them to continue walking in a circle. But it's not that easy. It's never that easy. Both of the tools you have come with long ass recharge times that force you to wait a bit before you can use them again. So what if you get in a situation where both animatronics are really close to your office? What do you do then? That's where the second tool comes into play. The buzzer allows a player to freeze Mary and Rascal in place if they are on the camera you use said buzzer on. You can use this to stall one of them while the PA system is recharging, or to catch both animatronics on the same camera to buy yourself a little more time. The way you use the PA system and buzzer is up to you, and it involves a lot of strategy to figure out the most optimal way to go about using both of them. It creates this extremely fun gameplay loop, where you're constantly planning ahead to try and best the animatronics spinning in circles around the building. Merrick's Arcade almost feels like a puzzle game, in the sense that there are a handful of solutions for each night that you need to trial and error piece together to complete the game. It's such a cool idea for a game, and playing it for the first time really caught me off guard. It made me play a FNAF game in a way I'd really never done before. Most FNAF games I end up being reactive to everything going around me, but here, I had to be proactive about every move I made, making sure I wouldn't get myself into unwinnable situations by playing my cards right. The camera tools are not everything you have at your disposal. A limited flashlight is also included in the kit. This flashlight is used in the office only, and allows you to stall any animatronic at the doorway while you're waiting for the PA system to recharge. Playing this game will get you into situations like this a lot, so get used to using the flashlight. I'm not 100% sure how this aspect of the game works, but I'll try and explain it the best I can. Okay, so when you're using the flashlight to stall an animatronic, not only is there a limited amount of power on it, but you can sometimes randomly have your light broken by an animatronic. I can't really say what triggers this, it seems to just happen randomly, but realistically it's probably just if you have your light on an animatronic for too long. Regardless of what causes it, it's easily the most confusing mechanic in the game. There's already a battery for the flashlight that goes down pretty dang fast. Seems almost unfair to have an animatronic break the light when it's not even empty. The actual worst part about this is that if the light break happens, it's game over and you get jump scared. It kind of does the whole FNAF 1 Freddy power out thing, 
but instead of just doing it at the end of the night when you run out of power, it's every single time the light breaks. So even when you know you're 100% going to lose, you have to sit through this really long animation every single time it happens. It's cool at first, but once you start reaching harder challenges, it just becomes kind of annoying. I think a pretty simple fix for this is to only have this longer animation play if it's at least 5 a.m. Since if it plays any time before 5 a.m., that extra bit of time the animation gives you won't even matter, and just slows down the pace of the game to a crawl for a second. Kind of on the same topic is the death mini games. Occasionally when you die, you'll have a shot at completing a death mini game, which is pretty neat. It involves doing a series of challenges with cookies that can bounce off walls. Your goal is to kill all the enemies and make it to the end. I'm not really good at it personally, but I won't let that take away from it being pretty cool. My issue arises when the death mini game shows up during the harder nights of the game. The death mini game is pretty long to just skip, since you have multiple lives in it, and since this game is so trial and error-y, you'll be seeing this mini game at least a couple times. I think an easy solution for this would to just be either decrease how much it can appear by a tiny bit, or make it so it can't spawn on like Night 5 onward. The game straight up gives you the ability to play the mini game from the menu after you beat Night 5 anyway, so it's not like it'll be impossible to play if these changes were put in place. Neither of these more negative points are super big deals, and don't take away from my love of the game very much but they did annoy me a bit while going through it, and I feel like I should at least mention them to be as transparent as possible about my thoughts and feelings, because going forward, everything else is pretty much entirely positive. But one more sour spot before we go back to the good shit. The jump scares in this game are pretty lame. They feel less impactful than the FNAF 1 jump scares, which should be the bare minimum for a game that's taking so much inspiration from it. The sound effect used for them is really unsettling though, great work picking that one out. It's a blood curdling scream sound that did get me a few times going through it. Anyway, the jump scare animations here are pretty much just characters awkwardly wobbling back and forth or jumping at you from a black PNG background, depending on the circumstances. FNAF 1 did a pretty good job with the jump scare animations, since a lot of the movement in them was a vertical chomping rather than horizontal swaying. Although the blackout jump scares are clearly inspired by Freddy's blackout jump scare. Maybe making the animation a little shorter would help improve the impact of the jump scares, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, moving on from the negative stuff, there's still one final animatronic in the main cast I have yet to talk about, and that's Scarlet. Scarlet is introduced during the middle of the game. Once she's active, she continues to be active for the remainder of the nights. Her mechanic works completely differently from Mary and Rascal. While your goal for them is to stall and lead them through the building, your goal with Scarlet is to repel her away from the office. Scarlet will show up on one of the two sides of the building, making her way to your location. All you have to do is find her on the cameras, look at her long enough, and she'll move back a camera. Keep doing this until she completely leaves the hallway, and you'll buy yourself a bit more time that you won't have to deal with her. I really enjoy the addition of this mechanic to the gameplay loop. While Mary and Rascal work on their own as a challenge, Scarlet raises the stress of each night by a bit, and keeps you on your toes, making sure she doesn't get too close to you. Scarlet can enter the office using the door at the front of the room, even if your cameras are down, so it's important to keep track of her as much as possible. Here's where an advantage of being able to hear the laptop's sound cues, even when it's down, comes into play. When Scarlet is at either of her final cameras before jump scaring you, a distinct sound will play letting you know she's close by. You can use this to your advantage to make sure she doesn't get into your office, but it's usually better to just chase her away camera by camera so you can deal with the other animatronics without being too worried for a little bit. Even if the cast is small, this game is definitely challenging and will force you to really think hard about each move you make and each tool you use. One of the best things about the game is that each night, the animatronics have the ability to start at different places on the map. Early on in the game, the cast starts at the show stage and slowly makes their way around the location. But the farther you get into the game, the more insane the placements get. By the time night six rolls around, Scarlet and Rascal are already on their final cameras at the start of the night, and Mary is one camera away from her final camera. Yeah, insane stuff. These start of night setups really force you to think fast, and devise the best way to go about picking off each very close threat one by one. I mentioned that Mary talks a bit on the cameras before, and there are some actual gameplay ramifications because of this. Occasionally, she'll do a magic trick and black out a bunch of your cameras to be audio only, which is pretty annoying for a game that is so heavily camera focused. It's not super unfair or anything though, since sometimes rooms will have distinct sound cues if an animatronic is in them, and because since most characters move in a circle, you can usually figure out what's going on at all times. Sometimes random music will play from cameras as well, which is always super unsettling. It's like this old timey song and every time it happens it makes my stress go way up, even though it means pretty much nothing. Speaking of cool in-game events like that, Mary's Arcade has one of the most interesting additions to a FNAF fan game I have ever seen. That being scripted events. What I mean by that 
is during the game, a couple scripted sequences happen that are used to completely catch the player off guard. Two really good examples of this are the Bait Mary jump scare and the Night 5 blackout. At the end of Night 3, a blackout happens and everything goes dark. Some noises can be heard from the background before BOOM! The lights spring back on and Mary is directly in front of you and still moving. She goes in for the kill and then right before she can get you, it hits 6am and she powers down. I was super surprised by this. Simple scripted sequences like this can really add a lot to an overall game experience, especially when you're doing the same gameplay for the entire thing. It's such a cool moment that I'll probably never forget, and things like that help leave a lasting impact on me as the player. The other standout scripted moment for me was during the last hour of Night 5. When it hits 5am, every single camera goes out and you have to beat the night without any visual aid from the cameras. I totally got confused the first time I made it here on Night 5, and ended up losing. But I was pretty quickly able to figure out the best way to go about it after that, and beat the main campaign. These cool scripted moments add a lot to the game and make me even more upset that it kind of went under the radar. Just for reference here, my video talking about Fan Game Direct, where I go over what we know about Mary's Arcade 2, is technically the most viewed Mary's Arcade related video on all of YouTube. Crazy, right? Such a phenomenal game with fantastic visuals and game design just slipped under the radar for pretty much every major English-speaking FNAF YouTuber. Tyken Sons was maybe a bit of a stretch to call underrated. It already had multiple videos with millions of views. I still stand by my opinion that at the time I made my video on it, Tyken Sons was underrated, because of how fantastic it is and how little I saw people talk about it. But Mary's Arcade is a very different type of underrated. This game seriously deserves way, way more love. I've been going on about it for this long already, and there's still more to talk about. A fantastic extras menu, with tons of cool shit an extra hard Nightmare mode that will really challenge your knowledge of the game and its mechanics. A custom mode that adds even more animatronics, which you all know is one of my favorite things in FNAF fan games. Don't worry though, someone has already beaten the max mode, so no 1422 situation here. There's also lots of easter eggs, just like the classic FNAF games, such as Golden Mary, which I was sadly not lucky enough to encounter myself, but they still made it in the thumbnail, eh? But seriously, if this video made you at all interested in the game, I highly recommend you go and play it for yourself if you can. The mechanics may be a little hard to get used to at first, but I promise you, stick with it and you'll find one of the most hidden gems in all of FNAF fan games. Mary's Arcade is getting a sequel as well, so make sure to go show that some love. Going into this game, I never expected to like it so much. On the outside, it really is one of the more simple looking FNAF fan games, and in some ways, it still is. No big over the top flashy models or cutscenes or whatever, but this game has passion, soul, and strong mechanics. And at the end of the day, those are really the only things you need to make a solid FNAF fan game. I've been Aya, uh, yeah, and I'll see you all next time.